Uh, I am Mark Craig and uh, lovely to be with you all. It's very exciting to be sharing this talk with you, knowing you're watching from all over the world. Um, I'm speaking to you from England. It's just after five o'clock. Uh, it's a lovely sunny day here. Um, now, I qualified as a vet a long time ago, back in 1985 from the University of Liverpool, home of the Beatles, of course. So here we go. Let's crack on. Um, in 1994, I set up Referral Referrals, a dermatology referral service for animals. And you can see on my um, Referral Referrals logo here, um, all the different mangy animals going into the referral referral treatment arc and of course uh, coming out uh, completely cured of all their skin problems now this wonderful logo was designed and drawn by my dear friend carl temple a fellow vet and wonderful artist who sadly passed away a few years ago so referral referrals is one of the oldest established dermatology referral services not all my patients are prize winners like this lovely basset here but they are all very special and i do what i can to help them enjoy a fantastic quality of life i work out of seven or eight veterinary practices across southern england and wales treating patients referred to me by other vets I see mostly dogs, but also cats and horses. And occasionally something a little more unusual. This fox was a film star appearing in quite a few well-known films. Unfortunately, he developed signs of skin allergies, which began to interfere with his film career. Now, skin allergies are very common these days, not only in dogs, but also in many other animals, not to mention ourselves. They can be caused by just about anything, but the most common triggers are things like house dust mites and pollens. Skin allergies can start at any age, but, but typically in dogs, they start between the age of six months and three years. The bad news is they often worsen with age and there's no cure. The good news is most dogs with skin allergies enjoy a very good quality of life provided they can avoid unpleasant side effects of drugs. For the most part, skin allergies do not make dogs sick or shorten their life. But what actually is an allergy? Well, an allergy is a disorder of the immune system. On the one hand, the immune system can appear to be overactive, producing too many antibodies to inappropriate things that should pose a dog no harm, like this house dust mite and various pollens and molds. These antibodies then latch onto cells within the body that release toxic histamine-like substances that make a dog itch and scratch, lick, bite and nibble. The signs of allergy vary considerably. For many dogs, the underneath areas are worst affected. Scratching damages the hairs which often fall out leaving behind ball patches and you can see these ball patches quite marked on this dog and also areas on the elbows where um, where the dog's been scratching and, and rubbing quite a lot the skin often goes red particularly in moist areas like the armpits and with time it thickens and become greasy and crusty other dogs have problems with their eyes, sometimes with conjunctivitis. They can scratch their eyelids really badly. With others, it's ears, sometimes just on the outside. You can see this ear is quite bald where the hair has come out and also um, where he's developed crusty patches over the ear flap where he's been scratching. So sometimes on the outside, but often on the inside as well. I'm sure many of you have had dogs with ear problems and have seen how painful they can be. Sometimes the lips can become very sore, very red and inflamed and quite weepy and smelly. 
The legs generally come in for a lot of self-trauma, sometimes in and around the elbows. And these are very moist uh, and very red, as you can see, and a lot of the hair has come away. Sometimes the whole of the lower leg gets, li um, gets licked and can become very red and sore. And again, all the hair come out. And sometimes the feet. The feet are very commonly affected. It can start off being maybe just the front feet or just the back feet, but with time, all the feet may be affected. Affected dogs will lick and bite between their toes, causing redness and often little spots which can be very sore and itchy. Constant licking and biting damages the skin, and after a while, the skin between the toes goes dark and even black. Sometimes a dog will lick or bite so much the toes become really swollen and bleed. Spots can develop under the paw too. Dogs with these kind of spots often find it quite painful to walk and can feel pretty miserable. A lot of dogs with skin allergies bite under the tail as well. You can see again this darkening of the skin that we saw earlier between the toes. People are often worried that this is a sign of melanoma or skin cancer, but it's just part of the inflammatory process going on within the skin. With time, if we can suppress the inflammation and licking, this blackness should just subside. So on the one hand, the immune system is overactive, causing all this irritation. On the other hand, it can appear to be underactive and not deal adequately with microorganisms that normal dogs carry and would not be expected to cause problems. One of these organisms is the yeast, a type of fungus. Now this is a view of the yeast under the microscope, magnified by about 500 times. There's lots of yeasts here, now all these things here coloured purple, lots and lots of them. They're shaped like peanuts or pear drops. Now yeasts release very toxic substances into the skin, sometimes causing intense irritation, infection, and even triggering additional allergic reactions. In extreme cases, the yeast can colonize the whole skin. This dog with a severe yeast overgrowth was almost completely bald. These poor dogs are very itchy and smelly. This is actually a Westie, believe it or not. Other organisms that can breed out of control are bacteria called staphylococci. And you can see all these little round dots here. This is a, obviously seen under the microscope as well. These are all staphylococcal bacteria. And this is an infection of the hair follicles caused by the staphylococcal bacteria. And you can see the red rash and sometimes little um, heads on the spots here. And here's another rash with more prominent spots, quite a few with heads on here, quite um, definite frank pustules here. Spots fade away, leaving areas of redness, crusting and scaling. Infection sometimes breaks right through the hair follicles into the deeper skin. These can be very hard infections to resolve. How do we diagnose these skin allergies? We do so from the clinical history and ruling out similar conditions such as mange, a mite infestation. Once we've made our diagnosis, we have the option of allergy testing to try to identify the individual triggers. There are two types of allergy test, of which the intradermal test is seen as the gold standard. And you can see me here performing an intradermal test. With the dog comfortably sedated, I inject tiny amounts of extracts of environmental substances like house dust mites, pollens and insects into the dog's skin. After about 15 minutes, I look for nettle sting type reactions of redness and swelling. You can see lots of different reactions here. And each one 
um, above each felt tip pen mark. These are all felt tip pen marks. And above each one, I have an individual reaction. And I'm looking for swelling um, and uh, sometimes redness. Some of these reactions are, are pretty red. And each of these denotes a specific individual reaction. Uh, you'd think these would be quite sore, but in fact, most dogs have no problems with it. And even um, when you have lots of positive reactions like you do here, once I wake them up from the sedative, uh, very few of them even scratch at where I've done the test. Now, there's also another uh, type of test which involves taking a blood sample. And neither of these tests is reliable for documenting reactions to food, partly because many dogs may be intolerant of foods rather than allergic in the strict sense of the word. Now, I've written about food intolerance in a paper published in the Veterinary Journal of Small Animal Practice. The paper is open access, which means that it's available to everyone and free of charge and can be downloaded from my website. And you can hear there's a link to it here, which is a hyperlink. So if you're seeing this um, now or later, I think you should be able to click directly on here and it should take you to my website where you can uh, where you can view this article on food intolerance. When dogs are food intolerant, the immune system is not involved in the same way as with a true allergy. The conventional way to see if particular foods are contributing to skin disorders is to feed a restricted hypoallergenic elimination diet for two or three months. See if the dog improves, then give back the full old diet and see if the dog goes worse again. The dog is then put back on the restricted diet and once improvement recurs, individual food items are added sequentially to determine whether they're tolerated. It sounds straightforward, but there are many difficulties, both in carrying out the diet and in interpreting the results. I recommended this approach for years, but very rarely saw any improvement. There are three main reasons for performing allergy testing. To try to identify individual triggers, to see if these triggers can be avoided, and to, to identify items for possible inclusion in a type of treatment known as immunotherapy. Now, what all of you want to know, I'm sure, is how do we make these dogs better? How do we treat them? How do we restore them to winning first prize? There's no short answer to this. Every dog is different. Traditionally, the most effective and often the cheapest form of treatment is using steroids. Steroids can be dramatically effective, often within hours. The problem with them is the risk of both short and long term side effects. The most common side effects are eating and drinking a lot and peeing a lot. However, they can also cause behavioural changes, affect the liver and kidneys, trigger diabetes and adversely affect the immune system. They can also lead to calcium building up in the skin, causing an unpleasant crusting condition known as calcinosis cutis. Ideally, steroids should be avoided, but they can be very helpful if used in a controlled, sensible way. You've probably also heard of Apoquel and Cytopoint. Apoquel and Cytopoint are not steroids and are more expensive than steroids. They too can be dramatically effective. They have been around a lot less time than steroids, but do not appear to be associated with serious side effects in most dogs. Immunotherapy is an attempt to address the allergy itself rather than just masking the signs. It's customised for each individual patient based on the results of allergy testing and aspects of the dog's history and lifestyle. It can be given either by injection or orally as a spray. Up to 70% of dogs gain benefit from immunotherapy, and it's well worth considering when allergy testing has demonstrated positive reactions. There are other less drug orientated ways of treating skin allergies. Avoiding the triggers is theoretically the best approach, but also the hardest. House dust mites are a fact of modern life. Avoiding them is next to impossible. 
Keeping a dog outside in a kennel has the potential to be very helpful in dogs that are, that are allergic only to house dust mites. However, most people do not want to keep their family pet outdoors 24 hours a day. If your dog tests positive for house dust mites, it doesn't mean or even imply that you're not doing your hoovering. Frequent hoovering is unlikely to resolve a dog's skin allergy, although it can be helpful. Replacing carpets with solid floors could be considered, along with avoiding quilts, cushions and pillows in certain parts of the house where they're present. And then it's important to remember we have our own natural immune system. Now, right in the middle of the screen here, where my cursor is, you can see these dots. These are the bacteria again, but these are actually being eaten, if you like, by a white blood cell called a neutrophil. And this is the body's part of the, the way that the immune system works. It actually mocks up the bacteria that are present. So we have our own natural defences, which, given chance, can be very effective in helping to resolve particularly the more minor infections that our dogs get. Does your dog like a wash? Although we shouldn't shampoo dogs any more than we have to, using the right sort of wash in the right way can be very helpful for dogs with skin allergies, minimising the need for potent drugs. Just with washing, we can achieve tremendous results. We can transform this into this. Now, I want to return to food. How many of you recognise this breed? If we were interactive, I could ask you to choose a button. Um, well, it isn't actually a dog. It's a wolf, an Arctic wolf. But you can still have full marks if you said wolf. The modern domesticated dog and today's grey wolf are both believed to have descended from wolves, now extinct, that lived between 9,000 and 34,000 years ago. As we all know, wolves are carnivores. They prefer freshly killed meat when available, not just the muscle meat, but all parts of the prey, especially the organs and bone. Now, clearly, dogs are not wolves, but they did evolve from them and are still genetically very similar. Dogs too are carnivores, and a carnivore in its natural environment eats food high in animal protein and low in carbohydrate. Protein is made up of amino acids. Animal protein <clears throat> is a much richer source of amino acids than plant protein, and much more balanced. Every part of the prey is important for carnivores. The organs such as liver, kidney, <clears throat> heart, stomach are rich in B vitamins, vitamin A, minerals and fatty acids required for maintenance, growth and reproduction. Bone supplies calcium and phosphorus in favourable proportions. Other poorly digestible parts of the carcass, like cartilage, scale, fur, tendon and even teeth, are very important too. They can be thought of as animal fibre. And just like plant fibre, animal fibre helps to maintain the intestinal microbiota, the collection of microbes that lives in the canine gut. Now, gut microbes play a critical role in health and well-being. If you'd like to find out more about the intestinal microbiota and how it may be linked to skin allergies, you can find my paper on the subject. Um, you can find this on the website. And this is also an open access um, open access paper. Um, but again, you should be able to click on this hyperlink and, uh, and view and download the paper. It was published in Veterinary Medicine and Science in 2016. We know the ancestral dog ate 49% of its calories from protein, mostly from fresh animal sources, and only 6% from carbohydrate. Today, only about 25% of calories supplied by a typical dry dog food are from protein and around 43% come from carbohydrates. Much of the protein in commercial dry dog food is from vegetable sources, cereal grains, pulses and soya, which contain not only a lower content of essential amino acids, 
but also a high level of anti-nutritional factors, which reduce the amount of nutrients available, adversely affect the gut and exert toxic effects on a dog's metabolism. So dogs that evolved on meat-based diets with low levels of carbohydrate are now being given food containing very high levels of carbohydrate, included primarily as a cheap source of energy, and yet dogs have no requirement for carbohydrate. Now, all this does not mean that dogs with skin allergies will be magically cured if they switch from a commercial kibble to a raw food diet, but surely it makes sense to feed a dog a diet as closely resembling its ancestral diet as possible. And I have explored this idea in a paper published earlier this year in the veterinary journal UK Vet Companion Animal. This paper has also just been made open access, which means you can now read it free of charge and you can download it from my website in a similar way to how we were describing earlier. So what bearing might feeding a raw food diet have on dogs with skin allergies? Earlier, we described the conventional way of investigating food involvement in skin allergies. This is very difficult to do reliably. Dogs like to scavenge and pinch other dogs' food, cat food, and our food, anyone, anyone's food. They always have an eye to the main chance. Feeding them a highly restricted diet for two or three months and being sure they don't eat anyone else, anything else is virtually impossible. I rarely recommend this anymore. Now I suggest owners consider a fundamental change in their dog's diet, ideally to one based on raw meaty bones, and stick with it for at least six months if the dog likes it and has no problems with it. Many people I see have already been thinking about raw feeding, and most are certainly prepared to give it a try. I never push it though. If people are not keen, I might suggest alternatives such as grain free or ready meal pouches that are lightly cooked and frozen. I discuss the pros and cons of whatever diet they choose and the precautions they need to take. Commercially available packs of frozen minced up raw food are very convenient, provided you have plenty of freezer space and are readily available from farm shops, pet shops and online retailers. You have company support and are usually given feeding guidelines. However, many people prefer to source the food themselves. It's time consuming, but more fun. And you have control over what you're feeding. It's also a lot cheaper. What you feed clearly depends on the size and individual needs of the dog. Chicken wings are a favorite for small dogs. One point I must emphasize, and that is bones must always be fed raw. Never give a dog cooked bones as they can splinter and cause serious problems. My cat Boots likes chicken wings. He's also very partial to pig's hearts. Larger dogs will easily devour whole chicken carcasses. Most people feed the frames with most of the meat stripped off. This dog is clearly in for a treat. If you want to avoid chicken, lamb breast is ideal. It contains bone and is quite a cheap cut of meat. Ribs also go down well with most dogs. Cheap heads are perhaps more for the experienced connoisseur. I know quite a few other people are speaking about raw food today, so I'm leaving a lot of the practicalities for them to discuss. And I'm trying to relate raw feeding here as much as possible to skin disorders and to allergies. So let's have a look at a few itchy dogs who've had the joy of switching to raw. This is Riley, the Labrador. Riley was three years old when I first saw him, and very prone to episodes of itch and skin infections all over his body. He was particularly prone to large, weepy, crusty sores on his abdomen for which he needed ongoing apoquel and intermittent courses of antibiotic. He hadn't improved on three months of a grain-free diet. I found he was allergic to many things, including house dust mites, pollens, molds, and bird skin. After overcoming initial reservations, Riley's owner started him on a home-prepared diet 
based on raw meaty bones, feeding mainly chicken carcasses, for which he found a good, cheap, reliable source. Like most dogs who go on to raw after years of kibble, Riley's relationship with food was transformed. He now loves his food, spending hours digging holes, burying his food and returning to it later. As I speak, he's been on his raw diet for over two years. He's not currently taking Apoquel or any other medication and his skin is clear. Sam was a two-year-old neutered male Springer who was forever scratching and developing red sores on his face around his eyes and muzzle. It's a little bit dark, this photo, but you can see he's got some red patches here around his nose um, and also some bald patches around his eyes. He also had lots of red spots and crusts on his abdomen and in his groins. He responded well to steroids and Apoquel, but would relapse if treatment was withdrawn. Following a change to a raw diet, he became a much happier boy and was able to stop his medication without relapse. When I first saw Jensen, a two-year-old crossbreed, he was very badly affected with episodes of recurrent itch and dermatitis. After much difficulty, we were able to control Jensen's severe irritation with a combination of Apoquel and raw feeding. Elsa is allergic to house dust mites. Since starting her raw diet about seven years ago now, her itching has been well controlled. She eats a very varied home prepared diet of raw meaty bones and has had virtually no medication now for years. Many dogs with skin allergies appear to improve when they change to a raw diet. Their teeth and gums improve out of all recognition. They have a better coat quality. They're better behaved. They have more energy. They digest their food better with less wind and better formed feces. Some dogs who've never been that fussed about their food suddenly start to enjoy it, often become really ex becoming really excited about it. We need to reconsider how we think of food for our dogs. Is it something synthetic, lifeless and sterile that comes in a box, tin or packet and wolf down, forgive the pun, in 10 seconds? Or is it something real, natural and nutrient rich that works the teeth and gums, keeps the dog interested for lengthy periods of time, stimulates him and provides a great source of enjoyment, not to mention lots of probiotics and prebiotics. Raw feeding is not a miracle cure for dogs with skin allergies. There is no miracle cure. However, most of my clients who've made the transformation to raw say that for so many reasons, they would never go back to feeding their dogs conventional processed food. Well, that's more or less it. Um, if you'd like to learn more about canine atopic dermatitis, I have a lecture broadcast on a platform called Henry Stewart Talks. And Henry Stewart Talks have very kindly agreed to provide you free access for the whole length of this talk until the end of September. And you have to access it via this link, that HS Talks link um, at the top here. Um, and that will work until the end of September. You can go via my website, uh, but that will only give you very limited access to the talk. Thank you to UK Vet as well for having just made the article on raw feeding open access. So you can view this free of charge. Normally it's a subscription only um, journal. So uh, it's great that everyone has open access this to, uh, to raw food, uh, to my raw feeding article now. And last, but by no means least, thank you to Sandra for her courage and enthusiasm in organising this wonderful conference. Hi, Mark. Oh, um, hi. God. How are you? <laughs> um, yeah, there's a, can you I see the button I... with the screen on it? Pardon? Um, there's a button with, the with a small screen at the bottom. If you just click that, it will stop the sharing.
Um, uh, we did get a few questions from the attendees. Yeah. Um, can I feed a couple through to you? You can, you can. I'm glad um, you're me loud and clearly. Yeah, I can hear you perfectly well. Um, guys, if you keep, want to keep sending some questions, I'll pose them to Mark in a moment. Um, so one of the questions that we had was about um, types of meat. So one of the comments was about lamb um, and that being considered a hot protein. Um, would Is that something you would recommend people not to eat if, they, if their dog had allergies? Um, what kind of meat would you recommend um, yeah. if, if, yeah? Yeah, theoretically, any meat is, uh, is good. I, I wouldn't consider lamb to be a hot protein at all. Um, it is a slightly fattier meat than than chicken. Um, some dogs don't do so well, and you have to watch the weight gain issue. Um, but there is no no reason at all why most dogs shouldn't have lamb. Um, no, it's uh, it, it, it's a very good meat. Okay, um, we've got another one. Um, they're asking about antibiotics. And if you would combine that with the diet, or would you move, or would you not use the antibiotics in severe cases of allergies, for example? Um, I try to avoid antibiotics if at all possible. I use a lot fewer antibiotics than I used to, say, um, uh, five years ago. Um, I think that we have a lot of problems now with antibiotics in terms of resistance. And um, a lot of antibiotics are becoming ineffective, ineffective. And if we're not careful, we, we, no antibiotics are going to work for ourselves as well as, uh, as, as our pets. So I feel we ought to use antibiotics only if they're really necessary. So I do try other things. And I would say in the majority of cases, we don't actually need to use the antibiotics. But in some really severe infections, we do have to use them, I'm afraid. And if we don't clear the infection up, other types of treatment, like with the diet or shampoos, um, they're not going to work as effectively. OK, um, there was another question from Audrey um, and she was asking about um, small dogs that might not have teeth. What would you do in that instance? Um, hi, Audrey. Thank you for that question. Um, it's more difficult. Um, Dogs um, dogs do need teeth to, to chew their food. And if they're gonna um, have lots of bones to crunch into, uh, it makes it very difficult. Um, so I think you might have problems with that one. Um, although maybe some of your other speakers who are talking about raw food, maybe uh, they may say, oh no, no, they can cope perfectly well. I suspect they might find it a lot more difficult. Um, it might take them a lot longer. So I think you would need to be careful. Okay, um, there's another one from Mary, um, and she said that, um, what can she do for like allergies, seasonal allergies that flare up? Um, so they might not be necessarily there all year round, but just like humans, they do flare up during certain periods. What could she do with that? Um, I think, again, it's important to find out what the allergies are to. If they're that seasonal, it's likely that they will be related to pollens. Um, so avoiding the pollens would be desirable. But again, as I was saying in my talk, um, sometimes avoidance of these things is difficult. And uh, a dog has to live. It has to enjoy life. And going out for walks and going out and about um, is part of being a dog. So avoiding the pollens really is probably going to be pretty difficult. Um, but immunotherapy that I was talking about, um, that can sometimes help. Um, washing a dog down after bringing it in, after being out from, for a walk can be helpful. Um, I think those are the things to look out for. And, and sometimes if, if the dog uh, has a seasonal problem, then symptomatic treatment, such as I was talking about with the steroids Apoquel, if it is quite severe, the symptomatic treatment doesn't need to be given for that long. So it's less like these treatments are less likely to cause side effects if uh, if you're only giving them for, say, a few weeks or a few months of the year. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we've got another one. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this name properly. Um, it's Onamari. Um, she said, how can we um, know the difference between a dog that's licking um, their paw or a specific uh, part of their body due to food allergies or um, because of stress? Um, you can't specifically, uh, at least not on the face of it. What you need to do, it, it needs somebody to um, study what's going on in detail. Um, my consultations, for example, usually last about an hour and a half. So I have a lot of time in which I can sit down and talk to people, um, find out uh, what's going on, um, find out what's going on in the dog's life, whether there is a lot of stress about, whether it started or got worse after um, uh, another dog in the family died or with emotional problems going on in the household. Uh, you need to look for that kind of thing, but you always need to consider, even when stress is there, that there may be some underlying factor like an allergy going on. And I find that stress will often make an allergy worse, but it doesn't tend to cause it in most dogs. Um, okay, there is another one that we've received, um, and it says, um, you've mentioned that dogs don't need carbs. Um, and then is a keto diet considered appropriate for all or some dogs? Um, is that something um, you can comment on in, in regards to allergies? Um, dogs have no documented requirement for carbohydrates. Um, in reality, um, if, um, if all the carbohydrates were stopped, uh, dogs would um, ultimately do fine. Uh, they don't need them like they do protein, like they do fats, like they do lots of vitamins and minerals. But in reality, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to feed a diet that is completely free of carbohydrates. And um, even, even meat-only diets will contain some carbohydrate. Um, and certainly in bone and cartilage, you will go, get carbohydrates. Uh, I think ketogenic diets um, have a lot of application, both for ourselves and for our animals as well. Again, ancestrally, in the past, um, dogs would have eaten what would have effectively been a ketogenic diet. I think one of the problems that we have um, in our modern society is uh, not just what we eat, uh, uh, or what our dogs eat, I should say, but um, how we feed them, how often we feed them, um, I think perhaps we tend to feed our dogs too frequently. And dogs, even on a raw food diet, can put on quite a lot of weight if they eat too much. Um, remember that when dogs were out in the wild, they didn't eat every day. They didn't eat twice a day. They didn't eat three times a day. Uh, they would gorge themselves silly um, on a huge feast and they might go a week or several weeks without anything to eat. Now, I wouldn't suggest that you don't feed your dog for several weeks. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, going without a meal every now and then um, would not be such a bad thing um, and would help to mimic a, a ketogenic diet um, and make a ketogenic diet perhaps more uh, effective and useful um, than feeding a high fat diet meal in, meal out every day. Yeah, um, there is a question on supplements and seasonal allergies. Are there any supplements that you um, encourage your um, patients or well, parents of the patients to take? Um, as a general rule, I don't like supplements. I think it's much better that they get all the nutrition from the food that they eat. The food that they eat is, uh, is natural, um, for the most part anyway. Uh, as natural as it can be in today's society. Most of the supplements, uh, well, supplements are, 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 not, are not so natural. Uh, they're all sort of made in a, in a, a slightly artificial way. Um, having said that, I do use some, um, particularly things that supply things called essential fatty acids, um, which um, can help dogs with skin problems, help to optimize their coat condition, um, help to encourage them to produce their own natural anti-itch, anti-inflammatory substances um, in a more gradual way, uh, in a 
in a more natural way than say when you give a dog steroids they're not as dramatically a, as effective as with steroids um but they don't um, carry the same risk of side effects either okay um i think we'll do two more terry is asking about fasting for toy breeds um how long do you think um fasting for a toy breed would be appropriate um uh, I think you have to be careful with fasting, um, particularly with dogs that are not used to it um, in the same way as people when they try fasting. I think you have to go into it gradually. Um, I think there's no reason why toy breeds shouldn't fast, but I wouldn't suddenly launch into a week long fast. Um, a young growing dogs, I think you do need to feed frequently. But once you have a mature, uh, a mature dog, um, then you could try say um just cutting out one meal and uh and, and see how you get on i'm sure uh i'm sure that uh, your dog wouldn't be too happy initially but um I, I think it's something that you would have to try out and see okay um there's another one from pam and she's asking about treating bacterial ear infections due to allergies um what would you recommend uh, I think you uh, it's difficult to, 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 to say at the outset about ear infections precisely what's involved. Uh, they get quite complicated. You have the effects of the allergy itself, which causes a lot of inflammation within the ear canal. That inflammation alters the environment within the ear. And so bacteria and yeasts that, that are there um, anyway, causing no problems, flourish and breed and they can cause very bad infections. So um, in some cases, just using a good quality eardrop that you can get from your vets um, is actually very helpful. And it also contains, they also contain some steroid which acts as an anti-inflammatory. Now, sometimes unless you control the inflammation within the ear, you'll find it very difficult to get on top of the bacteria and you find it difficult to get on top of the yeasts. So just using some sort of cleaner that um, has uh, an antimicrobial action may not be effective um, in severe cases. Uh, it, it is a combination of using different preparations, which um, I think in many cases you will have to visit your vet and have your ear checked, uh, have the dog's ear checked out to determine what sort of treatment is necessary. Once it's all under control, then um, a, a, a much milder cleaner. Uh, may be effective in just keeping things at bay. Okay, perfect. I think that's the last of the questions, Mark. Um, thanks for the session. That's that was a lot of information there. Uh, I will give everyone access to the, the articles that you've written, and they'll also have links to your webpage, which I've sent through the chat already. Okay. So, yeah, anyone, if you want any further information, you can visit. Um, Mark's website. I will just share a screen with a bit more information um, about him. Um, just give me a second. So um, I'll just leave that so you guys can just take a picture if you like and just save the information. And has it come up? Yeah, so that's just um, about Mark. There's a link to his website and the articles on there and then also um the the he's co-authored books and and just the um associations that he's also um a member of so you can just take a picture if you like of that screen and it should have all the information that you need to contact him and access the articles um perfect thanks very much mark for coming and sharing all your wealth of knowledge uh, my pleasure all right, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Take care, Mark. Bye-bye.